Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be chapter 4. I'm sorry, chapter 5. Chapter 5. We did 4 yesterday. Chapter 5's title is called, All Israelites Are Not Jews. Yeah, that's actually the title of the chapter 5. I'm reading from the book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. This book is about 100 years old. So, let's get going. Looks like we're starting to get into the good stuff. And by the way, this is page 62. And this book has approximately... How many pages? Uh, 371. It looks, well, let's just say over 360 pages. That was the appendix, by the way. All right, let's get going. After the division, which occurred among the seed of Abraham, in the days of Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and before the two kingdoms had settled down to steady going, there arose several contingencies which we must understand before we can intelligently follow their history any further, any farther. By consulting the 11th chapter of Second Chronicles, we find a brief recapitulation of the history of the revolt of the ten tribes to which are added further details as to the result. A list of the cities which were built by Rehoboam for the defense of the kingdom of Judah and the following. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and stores of victuals, um, you know, food, and stores of victuals and of oil and wine and in every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel, i.e. the territory of country occupied by the ten-tribed kingdom, resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem, for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he, Jeroboam, king of, you know, Israel, ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord, hmm. and after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong. 2 Chronicles 11 and chap, uh, verses 11 through 17. Bob's note here. There was a remnant in northern Israel that served the Lord that left the devil worship, the calf worship, the idol worship, and went to Judah. So there was definitely a remnant. All right, let's continue reading. These statements make, the, make, make it clear that uh, after Jeroboam, the king of Israel, had set up those golden calves and made priests of the lowest of the people, he would not allow the Levites, whom the Lord had made the priestly tribe of the race, execute any priestly offices or to conduct any services unto the Lord God of their fathers. And for this reason they returned to Rehoboam, who already, as is affirmed, had the tribes of Judah, and Benjamin on his side. Thus the kingdom of Judah, for a while at least, was composed of three tribes, 
in addition to those scattered families out of it, out of all the rest of the tribes who would not forsake the worship of the God of Israel and who would not worship the calves which Jeroboam had set up. But those people evidently lost their tribal relations and were assimilated into one of the three tribes of which the kingdom of Judah was composed. For in all the history and prophecy which concerns the three tribe kingdom, there was no tribal names used, save only those of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Bob's note here. Remember, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, was of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not sure this guy will go into that, but perhaps I will one day. But he was, he was definitely a Benjamin. Let's keep reading. Before we carry the history of these two kingdoms any farther or leave the ABC of this matter, we deem it important to place before our readers an array of scripture texts in which both houses, kingdoms, nations, or family families of Abraham's posterity through the Isaac-Jacob line are spoken of in the same passage in such a way that most simple-minded cannot fail to see that two distinct peoples are being considered. We cannot, however, at this juncture, give the relative place of these scriptures as, regarding, as regards the history, past, present, and future of these people under consideration. We place these scriptures before you only to show at present that ever after the division of the people into two commonwealths, in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, they were recognized in scriptural history and prophecy as two kingdoms or two nations. For instance, take the following. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. Hmm. I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. And that's in Jeremiah 33, 14. Here the Lord has promised to perform a certain good thing for the house of Israel. But he has just as assuredly promised to perform the same certain good thing for the house of Judah as well as for Israel. For the house of Judah is not included in the house of Israel and vice versa. Uh, people, that's like, you know, Germany and France are part of the European Union. But the French are not Germans, and the Germans are not the French. I mean, that's like saying Ireland, Scotland, and England are all the same people. I mean, the Gaelic language is different than English. They're not the same. For those of you in the United States, um, go to somebody in Georgia and call them a Yankee and see what happens. They might spit some tobacco chew in your eye. You know, uh, people from the South are Americans and people from New York are Americans, but New Yorkers are not Georgians and Georgians are not New Yorkers. So, you know, there's a difference. America's got 50 different states with 50 different kind of sort of different people in them. So, just something to consider. They're not the same people. Israel and Judah had different capitals. Samaria versus Jerusalem. They had different kings. They had wars against each other. I mean, they're different. And very, very, very few pastors will even touch on this. Matter of fact, they want you to say, well, they're all Jews. Um, Judah was only 
one tribe, Pastor. One tribe. And one tribe only. And they want you to think all the promises and blessings that God made pertain only to, well, look up the second chapter and ninth verse of Revelation. Yeah, second chapter, ninth verse, uh, you know, the book of Revelation. Yeah, yeah, take a look at that. Pause right here and take a look. Let's continue reading. Uh, you know, well, Bob's note here. Hey, uh, you know, if your pastors don't even know this difference and they've got a bachelor's, a master's, a doctorate degree in the Bible, they're lying. They have to be. How can you read Chronicles and Book of Kings and not know this? They're liars. They're deceivers. Why do you support them? Why do you help them? They're deceiving you. And if they're deceiving you as something as simple as this, what else are they lying about? They want you to think the Antichrists, plural, are the chosen. Well, they are chosen, but not for the kingdom. They're chosen for the uh, lake of fire. And if you don't know what an Antichrist is, well, I'll be more than happy to help you uh, find out. What is an Antichrist? Well, that's real simple. Go to 1st John. Uh, first, not the book of John, but 1st John, which is towards the end of the New Testament. Look up 1st John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. And then ask yourself, what group of people deny that Jesus is the Christ? Hmm. In 1 Corinthians 16.22, you know, they tell you Paul is a false apostle. He says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, which means cursed. So if any man love not, if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be cursed. Is there any group of people that don't love the Lord Jesus Christ? They're cursed. And you're going to bless them? Or you're going to be part of a church that so-called that blesses those that don't love Jesus, that curse him? Or should I say synagogue? Well, yeah. Yeah, you get the idea. So, oh, and how many, how many pastors do you know that give you the definition of what an antichrist is? Not many. Well, you know, they don't have Jesus, but they got the Father. The Bible says if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father either. They're liars. Why do you support them? Why do you help them? Good question. All right, in 2 John chapter 1, 2 John chapter 1, we read the following in verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. If you don't have the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Um, that's why I would never, once I learned all this stuff, I would talk to Jehovah's Witnesses outside my door. Uh, they don't come to my door anymore because, um, I make fools of them, you know. I mean, they plainly said the world was going to end in 1976, uh, 75, 76. And then I, you know, I say, well, you know, they absolutely did this. You know, it was in their books and their writings. And 
doesn't that make them false prophets? And, you know, what can they do? All they can do is just, well, you know, we have new light. Yeah, you have new light from the angel of light, the devil, you know. So I'll talk to them, but they uh, they mark me down as an apostate, so they don't come to my, knocking on my door anymore. They don't want to uh, their, lose their members. So. so whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Listen to verse 10 carefully. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. What does Godspeed mean? It means God bless you. You know, that's basically what it's saying. God bless you. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Huh. So what happens when a church invites an unbelieving rabbi to to talk to speak into the so-called church if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine receive him not into your house neither bid him godspeed for he that biddeth him godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds how many people bless those over in the middle east that curse jesus christ and then they wonder why, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think you get the idea. And I'm really shocked I'm still on YouTube. <laughs> uh, either Father is, uh, Father is either protecting the channel or I'm one of them doing a really lousy job or the devil's, uh, seeing who's listening to me i don't know perhaps yeah i don't know all glory to Christ, all glory to christ and god the father let's keep reading the book take another as follows and i will cause the captivity of judah and the captivity of israel to return and will build them as at the first jeremiah 33 verse 7 here is a question, not only of the captivity of Judah, but also the captivity of Israel. Neither is it a question only for the return of the captivity of Judah, for there is promised also, in the same sentence, the return of the captivity of Israel, i.e. a people who are not included with Judah. Again, for lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Bob's note here. Um, you know, there's people that call themselves preterists that think that uh, Jesus returned in 70 AD and that this right now is Christ's kingdom. Uh, this evil world right now is Christ's kingdom, and he's returned, and he's ruling and reigning, I guess, in our hearts, because I don't see him on a throne anywhere. But they have to totally ignore the book of Revelation. And when did God return Israel and Judah to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Uh, he didn't. He hasn't. It hasn't happened yet. You know, they want you to think that, if, you know, 12 to 18 million you-know-whos are all of Israel and Judah. It just, it doesn't make any sense. It's why people lose their faith. That's why they don't believe the Bible. It's because they're looking in the wrong place for the wrong thing. You know, why is it when you lose something... Oh, it was in the last place that I looked. Well, of course it was in the last place you looked because if you hadn't have found it, you'd have kept looking. It's always in the last place you looked because once you find it, you quit looking, right? Yeah, something like that. So, um, all right. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and 
uh, concerning Judah. Jeremiah 30, uh, verses 3 and 4. Here is something that concerns Judah, but it also concerns Israel. And the people who it concerns are my people Israel and Judah. So, if Judah, the Jews, are the people of the Lord, then the Lord has a people besides the Jews whom he calls Israel and who are not counted among the Jews. Good point, Bob says. Uh, so if Judah, the Jews, are the people of the Lord, <coughs> then the Lord has a people besides the Jews whom he calls Israel and who are not counted among the Jews. Again, second chapter, uh, Revelation, and then take a look at verse 9. Yeah. Everybody should memorize that verse. Still another, for the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. Jeremiah 32, 30. You see that while speaking of the evil doing of his people, it was not sufficient for the Lord to speak of the children of Israel only, but the children of Judah must also be included in order to embrace all who are under consideration. In Jeremiah 13, 11, we have indisputable proofs of the two houses, since the broadest generic terms possible are used. Here it is. For as a girdle cleaveth, cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. Bob's note here. Yep, the Lord's calling, but they're not listening. They're not hearing. Well, maybe they, well, yeah, you get the idea. Let's keep reading. This statement gives to us under, to understand that the whole house of Judah are not all the Lord's people and that the whole house of Israel are not all of the Lord's people, but that it takes the whole house of Israel together with the whole house of Judah to make all of his chosen people. It also proves that there is a people called the whole house of Israel, of which the whole house of Judah is regarded as neither part nor parcel. True, they are brethren because they are all of the seed of Jacob. And remember Jacob's, Bob's note here, remember Jacob's name was changed by the Lord to Israel. So they're, it's synonymous. They're synonyms. It means, you know, Jacob and Israel is the same person. Let's keep reading. As such, they're Jacobites, or since Jacob's name was changed to Israel, his descendants may all be called Israelites. But it is a fact that the seed of Jacob have been divided by the will, the decree, and the direct inter intervention of the Lord into two kingdoms or nations, one of which, when politically considered, is called the whole house of Israel. Uh, Bob's note here. In other words, the ten northern tribes. Uh, is called the whole house of Israel, the children of Israel, the house of Israel, all Israel and Israel, while the other nation is called the whole house of Judah, the house of Judah, the children of Judah, all Judah and Judah, or the Jews. Bob's note here. Remember something. Bob's note here. Keep this in mind. Where are the Canaanites today? Are, is there a group of people running around that call themselves Canaanites? I can't find them. Can you? Can you help me out? Tell me where they are, who they are? No. Where are they then? Bob's theory. Bob thinks that they, the Canaanites, um, just uh, now claim to be Jews. I mean, after all, why not? So that's just my theory there. Alrighty, so we read the following. 
The name Jew is derived from, or rather, is a corruption of the name of Judah, singular Judah, or plural Judas. Judas possessive, uh, I don't know, Jew, Jews, Jews. Hence, it is that the name Jew or Jews are applied only to the people who composed the kingdom of Judah. Also, it was their land only which was designated as Judah and all Judah and which was finally become known as Judea and Jewry, all Judea and all Jewry. Indeed, long before the division took place, Moses, while prophesying unto the seed of Jacob, cried out, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. This can mean nothing else except that Judah was to be separated from his people, and finally, if that prayer is ever answered, was to be brought back to them. But let us continue our array of texts in which both houses are mentioned, almost in the same breath, and all right let's con uh this is from the bible and i saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding israel committed adultery israel committed adultery spiritual adultery i had put her away and given her a bill of divorce yet her treacherous sister judah feared not but went and played the harlot also uh, what's a harlot a whore it's just an old english word for whore and that is in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. Here, Israel and Judah are not the same. They are only sisters, both in shame. And the Lord said unto me, That backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. I mean, that is Bob's note here. That's pretty darn plain if you ask me. Backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. And that's in Jeremiah 3 and verse 11. Here, Israel in adultery, the, in idolatry, the adulteress, is justified more than Judah, the treacherous. Although God had said, Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. Hosea 4 and verse 15. Bob's note here. If you've never read Hosea, um, I've got at least one, maybe two studies on Hosea. Hosea is like, it's a love story. It really is. Between the Lord and his people. I mean, it's it's beautiful. And how many, how many pastors do you know that have ever really done sermons on it? Very few. I mean, what some people call identity preachers identity being knowing who Israel really is very very few people do uh, Hosea I mean Hosea is such a beautiful book um, I don't know and by the way people um, I'm gonna post on my community page um, where you can get my free downloads uh, for hundreds of hours of free Bible studies. Just download them, save them for later. Because um, one day we're going to wake up and my channel is going to be gone. And I mean, it's getting to the point where censorship is so bad. I noticed censorship about ooh, 15 years ago when I had a website for uh, uh, the Goth Kids, G-O-T-H. Yeah, if you're older and you remember Alice Cooper, that's, you know, nowadays it'd be like Marilyn Manson, you know, they they wear all black and they're into vampirism and death and all kind of death metal music. And uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter was kind of getting into that stuff. And I didn't know what it was, so I looked into it, and I was kind of like, 
not happy to say the least. So I made a website for uh, goths where I told them about if they want to live forever, they need the blood. And that was Book, John, Book of John, Chapter 6. And uh, where Jesus says, uh, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you know, have eternal life. But I didn't tell them it was Jesus until they got to the end. And um, Google totally delist delisted my uh, website from the uh, internet listings. I mean, it was gone. The only way I could find it is if I typed in the exact name. I mean, it was in, if you typed in goth, and or vampire i was on the first page i mean i was getting some days i was getting two three hundred emails a day i couldn't answer them all i was working a full two full-time job well no one full-time job and a part-time job I, I i couldn't answer them all i mean it made me sad but but then one day google, google deleted my listing from the uh internet and the emails pretty much stopped I would get maybe three emails a month when I was getting two, three hundred a day. So I've known censorship's been coming for quite some time. Believe me, I've known. Uh, but uh, yeah, yep, told him about the blood of Jesus, and it's gone my website that was so I let the website go because it, it wasn't worth paying for it when nobody can find it that's a shame but it's the way it is so hopefully a few of the kids learn something so and I wasn't even doing Bible studies back then not not on YouTube I didn't even know what YouTube really was so all righty let's continue reading i'm you know um and the lord said unto me that backsliding israel hath justified herself more than treacherous judah jeremiah 3 11. here israel in idolatry the adulteress is justified more than judah the treacherous although god had said though thou israel play the harlot yet not judah offend hosea 4 15 and he also said, I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, that I should altogether pardon them. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God. Hosea uh, verse, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. The name Jerusalem is often used to designate the people of Judah because it was their chief city. When Jesus wept over the city and cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her brood under her wing, but ye would not. He did not mean the streets and buildings of the city, but the people. And not only the people dwelling within the walls, but the nation as well. For it was not only the uh, capital of Judah, but it was their metropolis, their commercial center, their citadel, their royal city, their sanctuary, and in every way, the representative city of their nation. This being true, we may expect that the name of the capital city of the Ten Tribe Kingdom would be used as a representative name and applied to the nation. Also, since the name of Judah was given as a national name for the uh, Jude Jewish people, because of the fact that it was one of the royal sons from the tribe of Judah who led the revolt when... Um, she became a separate nation, and the fact that her kings were of Judah's line, thus making the tribe of Judah the representative tribe, so we might expect the same thing with reference to the ten-tribed kingdom. Jeroboam reigned over Israel in Shechem 22 years and was succeeded by Nadab, his son, who reigned two years. After this, Baasha conspired against him, killed him, and reigned in his stead. But he moved the capital to Tirzah, where he reigned for 24 years and was followed by his son, Elah, who reigned in that city two years. Then he was conspired against by Zimri, who reigned only seven days until he in turn was conspired against and died 
by burning the king's house down over his own head. Then Omri, who had conspired against Zimri and succeeded him to the throne, bought a hill from Shemar on which he built the city of Samaria, which became the permanent capital of the kingdom of Israel. Bob's note here, Omri. Omri was bad. He was bad news bears. I mean, you ever hear uh, George Thorogood's song, Bad to the Bone? You know, they played that in the uh, Terminator movie uh, when he went into the bar. Yeah, bad to the bone. Omri was bad. I think Omri had a son. I think I think Ahab was uh, King Ahab and Jezebel. I think Ahab was uh, Omri's son, if memory serves me correctly. All right, so. Um, hence, the name of the chief city of Israel, Samaria, is often used when referring to Israel in the same representative way that Judah is in the case of the Jews. For an example, take the following. Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? For from Israel was it also the workmen made it. Therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. And that's in Hosea 8, 5 and 6. Of course, the calf her herein referred to is the calf worship instituted by Jeroboam, who caused Israel to sin, and since the calves were made by the workmen of Israel, they were not God. Well, yeah, duh. So we see that Samaria stands for Israel, whose capital it is, and whose own workmen had made the calf, which they themselves worshipped. But this nation has another name, which stands for the whole, as well as that of Israel and Samaria. Look ye, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit falsehood. Hosea 7 and verse 1. Now remember, Ephraim and Manasseh were uh, the sons of Joseph. Keep that in mind. Let's keep reading. Thus we see the name of Ephraim is used as a representative name for the northern kingdom, just as the name of Judah is used for the southern kingdom, and that the names Israel, Ephraim, and Samaria are used as names of the ten-tribed kingdom in contradistinction to those of the three-tribe kingdom, which are Judah, Jerusalem, and the Jews. On the very day on which Moses died, while he was reiterating and enlarging upon the prophecies which Jacob had given at the time of his death, he made a prophecy concerning the preeminence of Ephraim in Joseph Israel as following. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of the bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Bob's note here. Unicorns. Yeah, a white horse with a horn sticking out of a horse's head, right? Wrong. You want to know what a unicorn is? Look up the Latin name of an Asian rhino. Uh, there's two different kinds of rhinos. There's Asian rhinos, and then there is African rhinos. Africa, African rhinos have two horns. Asian rhinos have one horn. Matter of fact, the name is uni, which means one. You never heard of united, unified, um, unity. Unity means one, or uni. Uh, unicorn... Unicornus rhinoceros or rhino, rhinoceros. That's it's a it's even in the Latin name of the Asian rhino. Uh, Unicornus rhinoceros or rhinoceros, depending upon how you pronounce it. Unicorns an Asian rhino. Um, 
just like there's Asian elephants and then there's African elephants. You know what the difference between an Asian elephant and an African elephant is? Uh, an Asian elephant, you can train, you know, like they do in Thailand. Uh, you can train them to do work and be friendly to people. Um, India, they used elephants for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, uh, to do, they've had war elephants where they put uh, like a saddle on them and people would ride on top of the elephant with uh, bows and arrows and use it for war. Or uh, they would use them to move logs and help build houses and stuff. But an African elephant, if you try to do that, they'll stomp you to death. African elephants cannot be trained, period. Cannot. Not to my knowledge. Asian elephants can. And you've got Asian rhinos and you've got African rhinos. African has two horns. Asian has one horn. Uh, a unicorn is not a horse with a horn sticking out of its head. And then they laugh at you. Oh, you believe the Bible in unicorns? <laughs> yeah. I did a video on that too. Yeah. On the very day that uh, on which Moses died, while he was reiterating and enlarging upon the prophecies which Jacob had given at the time of his death, he made a prophecy concerning the preeminence of Ephraim and Joseph Israel as follows. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of his head that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of the bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. Israel would push the people together to the ends of the earth and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Bob's note here. Isn't that what America and he, uh, England did. Didn't we push together the people to the ends of the earth? Colonies all over the world. Colonies all over the world. Between the United States and England, you had India was a colony. Uh, Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Burma. Um, China was partly a uh, a uh, colony for a while. Singapore, Midway, um, Hawaii, Canada. Of course, you know, you had England. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Bermuda, the Bahamas, the Virgin Islands, the U.S. and British uh, Virgin Islands. I mean, the uh, it was said the sun never set on the British Empire. And that was true. A hundred years ago, it was daylight in one of the British colonies. South Africa was a British colony for um, a while. That's an interesting story in and of itself. So, so, with them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. Isn't it funny that um, the news media tries to stir up hatred against Israel for doing what God said they would do? With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. With the name of Ephraim standing at the head of one of the two nations of Jacob, and the name of Judah at the head of the other, we can easily understand each expressions as the following, such expressions as the following. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? 
For your goodness is as the morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. Hosea 6 and verse 4. Since both Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, and Ephraim, the second son of Joseph, had been dead for nearly 1,000 years prior to the writing of these scriptures, which we have just given, we must know that these are national names used to represent the national conditions of the two nations which are addressed. Um, and yeah, he's right. This is Bob's note. Uh, when the book of Hosea was written, uh, Judah, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and Jacob, they'd all been dead for, you know, <laughs> around a thousand years. So, you know, they can't be talking about the people that are dead, but rather their descendants. Let's keep reading. So also is the following. Therefore will I be unto Ephraim as a moth. What does a moth do? Well, if you've got wool clothing, which is um, good for winters, we here we here in Florida don't know about much about uh, wool clothing, but uh, I lived in Colorado for a few years, and uh, they got a saying: "Cotton kills." Well, when it gets wet, because it doesn't. Cotton is useless uh, to keep you warm when it's wet. Wool is the opposite. Wool can get wet, and it will still keep you warm. Just the way it's. The, the, the way it grows, I guess. I don't know. But um, what does a moth do? Well, it eats uh, it eats the wool. Yeah. So you got nice clothing in your closet, and then the moths get in, and then next thing you know, your all your clothing has got holes in it. Therefore will I be into Ephraim as a moth, and to the house of Judah as rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jared. Yet he would not heal you of your wound, for I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away and none shall rescue them. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they shall seek me early. Hosea 5 verse 12 and 15. The Assyrians were uh, enemies of Israel. Matter of fact, uh, this is Bob's note here. The Assyrians eventually carried off Israel into captivity slavery and they never returned to the land and they went somewhere and the modern church world has no idea i know i know where they went but god knows where they went i think i know where they went god knows for sure i think i know but they never returned to the land so what is the remedy for their wickedness god says until they acknowledge their offense their sin and seek my face. They, you know, seek a, an audience with the Lord. Acknowledge their evil, seek the Lord, and in their affliction they will seek me early. Hosea 5, 12 through 15. Before proceeding further with the history of these two kingdoms, there is one other point which must be settled once, at, once for all. That is, the people of God, which he distinctively calls Israel, the heads of which are the birthright holders, are unto whom are given that national name, it coming to them with the birthright at the time of the transfer of that inheritance, are not Jews, that the Holy Spirit has never either in biblical history or prophecy called them Jews, and that they have never been called Jews except by uninformed historians and by unscriptural teachers of the Word of God. Wow, let's read that again. This is the people of God, 
whom he distinctively calls Israel, the heads of which are the birthright holders unto whom was given that national gain, name, it coming to them with the birthright at the time of the transfer of the inheritance, are not Jews, are not Jews, that the Holy Spirit has never, either in biblical history or prophecy, called them Jews, and that they have never been called Jews except by uninformed historians and by unscriptural teachers of the word of God. Understand us, we do not say that the Jews are not Israelites. They belong to the posterity of Jacob, who was called Israel. Hence, they are all Israelites, but the great bulk of Israelites are not the Jews. Just as the great bulk of Americans are not Californians, and yet all Californians are Americans. Also, as in the writing the history of America, we must of necessity write the history of California because California is a part of America, but we could write a history of California without writing a history of America. Uh, Bob's note here. Not all claiming to be you-know-whos are you-know-whos. Yeah, where are those Canaanites today? Where are they? I can't find them anywhere. Well, maybe I can. Let's continue reading. So in writing the history of Israel, we must need write the history of the Jews, but we could write the history of the Jews and not write the history of Israel. Or in other words, in writing the history of the many nations, we must write the history of the Jews for to say at least there are one of many nations but, in writing the history of the Jews, it must be utterly impossible to write the history of the many nations which were promised to the birthright people, whose national name is, in a special sense, Israel, and whose people are not Jews. Nationally speaking, they are brother nations, but not always very brotherly. But if we can keep track of the birthright nation, and if they have ever, uh, ever have that birthright promise fulfilled to them, then, and only then, can we write the history of the many nations which the Lord God of Israel promised unto their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Joseph, and Ephraim, and Manasseh? It will help us much in our study of this question to know just when and under what circumstances the word Jew is first used in the canon of sacred scripture. It was not until more than 200 years after the revolt of the 10 tribes from the house of David. It was at a time when Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, formed a federation with Rezin, king of Syria, and came up against Ahaz, king of Judah, to war for acquisition of territory. Uh, Bob's note here. The king of Israel made a deal with the king of Syria and attacked the king of Judah. But, uh, yeah, your Bible so-called pastors, teachers, will tell you they're all the same people. Hmm, interesting. That's like saying the uh, American Civil War between the states never happened, right? Because they're all Americans, right? Notice how the prophet of God speaks to these three nations, Israel, Syria, and Judah. He declares, and it, and it comes to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it. Jerusalem was the throne seat of Judah, but could not prevail against it. All right, so uh, Bob's note here. So Israel and Syria went up against Jerusalem, but they couldn't take it. Let's keep reading. And it was told the house of David saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. Isaiah 7, uh, 1 and 2. The prophet further explains that 
The head of Syria is Damascus. Damascus was the capital of Syria. And the head of Damascus is Reason, king of Syria. And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it shall not be a people. Marginal. From being a people, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. Isaiah 7, 8, and 9. Remaliah's son was Pekah, king of Israel. What Isaiah had to say concerning this war was for the purpose of making prophecies concerning the outcome. We must pass over the prophecies for the precedent for the present, as our object now is to show the difference between the Jew and Israel, and we have simply quoted sufficient for our purpose. We must now turn to the historic record of that war and read. In the seventh year, as king of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jophan, king of Judah, began to reign and reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. Then Reason, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, king of Judah, but could not overcome him. At the time, Reason, the king of Syria, recovered Elath to Syria and drove and drave the Jews from Elath. So, Bob's note, Elath was just a city. And the Syrians dwelt there unto this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Assyria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. So here it is. You have Israel and the Bob's note here. You have Israel and Syria going up against Judah, and then Judah goes and speaks to the Assyrian Empire. And I always found that confusing, Syria and Assyria. I'm not exactly sure what the difference is between the two empires, but they're not the same, evidently. So, so the king of Judah... So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. And that's in 2 Kings 16, verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 7. Here we have it clearly stated that in this war, the besieging party is Pekah, the king of Israel, who is the head of Samaria, which is the head of Ephraim together with another nation with whom they are confederate. And if we put it as Isaiah does concerning the other house, the besieged party was Ahaz, king of Judah, head of the Jews, whose head is Jerusalem, the head of the house of David. Do you see the point? The king of Judah, or the king of the Jews, was besieged in his capital and wanted to form an alliance with the king of Assyria and to secure him as an ally, even fond upon the king of Assyria saying, I am thy servant, thy son, and crying, come up, what for? To save the Jews from the hand of Israel. Thus we see for the first time the word Jews is used in the history of the Abrahamic race is at a time when the Jews in Israel were at war with each other. The Jews in Israel were at war with each other. Hence, we ask, if the Jews were the besieged and Israel was with the besiegers, how can it be possible that the Jews and Israel are one and the same people? Bob's note here, it's impossible. According to the conclusions of the great number of our learned men, also some higher critics, critics, we must needs concur, conclude that the Jews were fighting their own shadow, which would be reducing the whole matter to an um, argument, argument of absurdity. Well, he says it in not Latin, but it's an absurd argument. It is high time for the Christian world, yea, and all secular historians too, to awake out of sleep, 
take the advice of the learned Apostle Paul and cease giving heed to Jewish fables and quit telling the people that all Israelites are Jews. It is not true, never has been, and never can be, for the difference between them is not only political and territorial, but is a semi-racial. For although the inheritors of the scepter and the birthright were sons of the same father, they were not sons of the same mother. They were sons of the same father, they were not sons of the same mother, and thus they were only half-brothers. This together with the fact that Leah is described as tender-eyed and Rachel was said to be fair would make some strong facial and physical dis distinctions in the posterity of the two families. But when we remember that Joseph married an Egyptian princess, uh, Bob's note, no, 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 he married a Hiskosk woman who were Semitic cousins of the Israelites. The Egyptians were sons of Ham, who was the father of Canaan. Sorry, God, the Bible never talks nice about Egypt. Never, that I know of. If I, somebody can show me where God says something nice about Egypt, let me know, but I can't find it. Let's keep reading. But we must remember that Joseph married an Egyptian princess, thus blending the best Semitic blood with the royal blood of Egypt, and thus and making the posterity of Joseph half-blood Egyptian. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's a shame this book has got so much good stuff, but misses the point. Um, matter of fact, let me let me do something here real quick. I want to make sure um, I give you the right information about the Hiskos. This is Bob's note here. Um, Okay, it's H Y K S O S. Um, a people of Semitic descent who invaded Egypt and settled in the Nile Delta around 1640 BC. They formed the 15th and 16th dynasties of Egypt and ruled a large part of the country until driven out in 1532 BC. They were a Semitic people. Um, so, so yeah, they were a Semitic people, just like the um, Israelites were Semitic. They, I think, they were cousins, if I remember correctly. You know, you don't even, you don't even hear this stuff that nowadays. All right, that's the end of Bob's note there. Let's continue reading. Uh, let's see. The fact that Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, who were the... Uh, All right, the, this guy still thinks they're uh, half Egyptians. Psst. The fact that Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph, who were the final inheritors of the birthright, were half-blooded Egyptians. No, they weren't, you idiot. Is that uh, in that which he made it necessary for Jacob to adopt them and make them fully his own, as Reuben and Simeon were his before he could confer upon them the covenant birthright. This is the adoption to which the Apostle Paul refers in his argument concerning the children of the promise versus the children of the flesh as follows. Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the covenants, and the glory, and the giving of the law, and the service, and promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came. Um, here Israel as a whole, including both houses, are spoken of. Hence, to all who really believe, claim, or teach that the Jews only are Israelites, or and of all who believe that the word adoption as used in this connection can possibly have reference in any way to spiritual adoption we ask when how or where did there ever occur an adoption either spiritual or racial among the jews as a nation 
No answer required. Please reflect. An eminent, eminent theolog theological professor who gives an exegesis of the Sunday school lessons for the most prominent denominational papers in the country began his exposition on the call of Abraham as follows. We come now to the third of the great landmarks of history, the call of Abraham, from being in universal history, the record becomes national. Hereafter, we have to do with one people, the Jews. In the founder of the Jewish nation, we find not a conqueror or a lawgiver, but a saint. Um, yet it is a fact that the term Jews is not used in writing the history of the Abrahamic people until 1,200 years after the call of Abraham. It's funny, there's 12 tribes and they're calling Abraham one of the 12 tribes. Bob's note there. Another theological professor of one of our larger training schools defines the Jews as a name given to all the descendants of Abraham. Ah, oh, we ask when. Yeah, we ask when. Still another defines the Jews, a name given to the descendants of Abraham who were divided into 12 tribes, and yet it is a fact that in the scripture the name Jews was only given to those who dwelt in Jewry, whose country was occupied by the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, and did not include Samaria, the home of the 12 tribe kingdom. No, it is a fiction. It is a fiction which, which has been foisted upon us by modern scholars, many of whom are presidents and professors of universities, college, and theological cemeteries, I mean seminaries, yeah, I was right the first time, editors of religious and secular newspapers, doctors of divinity and church dignity, dignitaries, that the word Jew and Jews are equivalent to Israel, Israelites, Israelitish, Hebrew, and Hebraic. By not distinguishing Israel from Judah, we have in the Bible a, a historical and prophetic chain which can never be linked together and which sets all of the writers at variance with one another. For we cause Isaiah to question statements made by Jeremiah, set Joel, Amos, and Zephaniah against Zechariah, Zephaniah against Zechariah, cause Jeremiah to convict Hosea of being a false prophet, then make Ezekiel step in and contradict them both and many others in such a manner that one prophet is made to give the lie to the other. We feel sorry for the so-called higher critics, for they really do find trouble, but they cannot conceive that this trouble could by any possible chance arise because of their misconception of the subject matter. Hence, it must be in the style or manner of the prophet. Thus, if any of the prophets chance to reveal a mannerism at one time, which is not so plainly manifest at another, then the exclamation, ah, Eureka, we found it, there are two of them, are heard to vibrate and revibrate throughout the ecclesiastical world. Bob's note here. Can you imagine this? This book is over a hundred years old and they were teaching this garbage a hundred years ago. It's no wonder America um, fell so fast. I mean, um, America was going down the edge of the cliff a hundred years ago, but it really fell down quick in the in the 1960s. Uh, the Church of Satan was founded in 1966. So what does that tell you? All right, so let's keep reading. Is it any wonder that skepticism is rampant, both in the church and out of it, since the common error of Christen, Christendom 
is to regard the Jews as the whole house of Israel. Is it any wonder that Tom Paine lost his soul while following the beaten path of his fallacy? Uh, if you don't know who Thomas Paine was, Bob's note here, he wrote Common Sense uh, during the, uh, you know, back during the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence. He was an atheist. So, yeah. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Okay, back to reading. Is it any wonder that Tom Paine lost his soul while following the beaten path of his fallacy? For he did give the Bible up as a myth and boldly states in his writings that he was led into infidelity because he saw that the Jews could not, never could verify the promises concerning Israel. Bob's note here. Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, same thing. The Jews do not fulfill the prophecies that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't. So either the Bible's true, and the you-know-whos are not Israel, or the Bible's a lie. Take your pick. For it is true that God had declared through Micah of Israel, who was divorced and cast far off, that he would, at the proper time, make her a strong nation, while Judah was to become a remnant. Isaiah, Hosea, Jeremiah, and the New Testament declare Israel to be lost. Bob's note here. Read James, the book of James, chapter 1. James says, To the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greeting. God didn't lose his people. God didn't cast off his people. Only the church world is lost. God's people. All right, let's continue reading. Um, Isaiah, Hosea, Jeremiah, and the New Testament declare Israel to be lost, while both Jeremiah and Ezekiel affirm that Judah is well known. Hosea declares Israel to be as sands for a multitude, while Jeremiah insists that Judah is few in number and a remnant. Isaiah, David, Micah, Jeremiah, and others declare that Israel is the strongest war power on earth, never to be conquered by a Gentile power. And yet Jeremiah declares that Judah is without might. While Daniel bemoans and records the fact that the Jews will be conquered by a Gentile power, the entire line of prophets from Moses down declare Israel to be a continuous monarchy, Israel is to be a continuous monarchy whose scepter is held by the seed of David, while Judah is to be without government of their own and are to be ruled over. Hosea declares that Israel shall ride, but Judah shall plow. Moses also declares that there shall come a time in the history of Israel, the ten tribes, when they, are, uh, when they also shall be few in number, and yet it is prophesied concerning them that they shall obtain possession of great possessions, inheriting and establishing, peopling the desolate places of the earth, rule many heathen nations, rule many heathen nations, have a great revenue, become the mart of nations, hold the keys of commerce, be exalted above their neighbors, and become the chief of nations. But on the other hand, Judah is to be without geographical inheritance. Strangers in all countries howl for vexation of spirit, leave their name for a curse, be ashamed, and cry for sorrow of heart until the great day of Jezreel. And there you have it, people. That is the end of chapter 5. And with that, we say all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.